Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bill of Rights Institute's 10th period webinar series. Hi. My name is Kirk Higgins uh, and I am joined by two colleagues this week. My name is Rachel Davison Humphreys and I'm the Director of Outreach here at the Bill of Rights Institute. Hi, I'm Gary Coletti, uh, Senior Manager of Programs for Teachers and Students. And tomorrow is Halloween, hey! which is exciting. So we thought we would take today uh, and tell a few stories that are somewhat spooky, um, spooky. and relevant Eerie. to the holiday. Um, but also tie that into a conversation uh, about using narrative in the classroom. Mm -hmm. so, sure. Yeah. Uh, narrative is something that, that we discuss a lot. Um, we think it's a powerful tool um, that can be used to help students understand things. Uh, in spooky stories in particular, um, as we'll talk about a little bit, have a, have a, have a fun way um, of connecting relevant uh, details uh, in a way that might be shocking or exciting uh, or surprise students that they are interested in the topic that they didn't know they were interested in. Yeah, I like that they're often fuzzy mm -hmm. spooky stories because I think the tradition of spooky stories is maybe you embellish a little bit, maybe you add a little bit here and there. And so they're not the same kind of stories that where it's just this is the factual things that occurred, but rather they have this really cool emotional impact that I think are great hooks. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's weaved in sort of like narrative history. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's 100% right. Sometimes right. it gets a little fuzzy around the edges. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know. That's right. And that really, like, titillates the adolescent and the pre-adolescent, right? And mm -hmm. so they love scary movies. They love scary stories. I remember when I was, I, this is going to tell my age, but the, the Christopher Pike books were these incredible books in the 90s that were like spooky R.L. Stein. Right, like there's right. something about the unknown and the feeling of, of um, and the feeling of not knowing the world yet and the world could be this way right. and there are things i don't know and things i want to know that really um that really appeals to the adolescent as we're going through these stories if you have your own stories to share or if you have any comments we do want to interact with you throughout these so we have the comments here on youtube but we also have our facebook uh page which is facebook slash bill of rights institute or our twitter handle which is at br institute and you can reach us through any of those we're monitoring them so you can ask us some questions absolutely um, so if you guys don't mind, I'd like to start off Ooh. with a spooky story. Uh, if we could dim the lights. I know, a lot of lighting in here. There's uh, a lot of light, but it's okay. Um, but this story, is, this story is really interesting for a number of levels. And uh, just before we went on with the webinar, one of our teacher partners from South Carolina, Tom, um, right. actually reminded us of this story. So we're excited to include it because um, it has a little bit of a local twist. So it's fun. Uh, so let me, get, let me get comfortable. Let's yeah, that's right. So Aaron Burr, uh, <laughs> famously known for being uh, the Vice President of the United States and also uh, for shooting Alexander Hamilton on the plains of Weehawken uh, and uh, uh, is a notorious character already. Yes. Uh, but he had a daughter named Theodosia. Okay. Uh, Theodosia's, wife, or Theodosia's life uh, kind of took an interesting turn. So um, Aaron Burr, um, after the assassination of Alexander Hamilton, takes kind of a different path in life, um, ends up being uh, charged with treason, um, is banished from the United States, and is sent to Europe. Um, in 1807. Now, before this, uh, Theodosia, his daughter, had married um, in 1801 a, a man named Joseph Alston. Right? So Joseph Alston becomes a governor of the state of South Carolina. Uh, Theodosia and Joseph live together, but it's, it's sort of tenuous. So after Burr's uh, sort of spiral down, uh, many saw his fortunes as waning. And so uh, Joseph being a rich planter from South Carolina, uh, that can rescue us uh, from uh, from the, the the depth of debt, I guess. Uh, so people claim that this may have been less than a, a positive marriage, uh, but maybe it was exciting. Well, so uh, Aaron Burr returns um, to the United States in 1812. This is right about the time Theodosia's husband becomes governor of South Carolina. So she decides to take a trip up to see her father, who she hasn't seen in many years, because of course treason and everything else. Uh, <laughs> There's some things so, going on. Yeah, right. So <laughs> she books passage on a ship called the Patriot um, mm -hmm. that sails up Georgetown, South Carolina, uh, and it heads up to uh, New York, where she's going to see her father. The only problem is the ship never arrived. <gasps> so it's this mystery that abounds. Some claim that she was attacked, the ship was attacked by pirates. Um, it was a former privateer itself, so it's possible that maybe the ship changed its name and just drifted off to go do something else, perhaps taking her to see a lover uh, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps uh, she was wrecked and washed ashore mm -hmm. um, and began living another life to ah. somehow escape what she was trapped in. And this is where it gets a little bit of a local bend to it. So to our local. To our, our local, local. Right. right. So we're located here in Arlington, Virginia. Um, and just down the road from us is Alexandria, Virginia, which has been a town 
um, for one of the first main towns in, in um, the state and before colony of Virginia. Um, and there's a tavern there called Gadsby, Gadsby's Tavern, which I recommend you visit. Yes. Some of our teachers um, may have yeah, with us. That's right. If you right. come to our summer programs, you will likely visit. I mean, that's <laughs> that's right. It's a very old tavern. Um, but uh, in 1816, a mysterious woman died in room number eight at Gadsby's Tavern. Very and specific. No knows who she is. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but yet in St. Paul's Cemetery, St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Alexandria, okay. there is a tombstone to this mysterious female who died. And the, the tombstone reads as follows. To the memory of a female stranger whose mortal sufferings terminated on the 14th day of October, 1816, aged 23 years, eight months. Hmm. This stone is placed here by her disconsolate husband in whose arms she sighed out her latest, her latest breath and who under God did his utmost even to soothe the cold dead ear of death. How loved, how valued once avails thee not to whom related or by whom begot a heap of dust alone remains of thee. Tis all though thou art and all the proud shall be. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. What? So very spooky. Uh, <laughs> was, it, was it Theodosia? I'm not sure. Wait, but her husband gave, was like, made the tombstone or he something. Was. Why do we think that's Theodosia? Because she was a mysterious woman who washed ashore. Of the town. And, has town. Have... and the town has okay. been decrying this. Now, it is the case that this story came about uh, in the 1880s. Okay. Uh, and so may have been a ploy to get more people to come in and visit. <laughs> Uh, Gatsby's Tavern. <laughs> uh, Marketing tool. But, uh, but she but had right. connections to the D.C. Yeah. area. Yeah. You know? So it's possible that she would have come to Alexandria. Alexandria right. being a major port town. Absolutely. Uh, it's possible she was trying to escape. Who knows if this is the original husband. Uh, but mysteries abound. But uh, but I like that story because it, it does have a bit of mystery, but it also ties back into yeah. U.S. history pretty well. There, is, is, it, it? is it possible that Epitaph is a clue to something? It could be. <laughs> it sounds like it would be. It does, doesn't like it? You take the letters out in a certain order. If only we could look at the back of the Declaration of Independence. Right, which is also nearby. It's like those local things. That's well, right. So that's what I love. I love Halloween. So Halloween is one of my personal favorite holidays. It's up there with Thanksgiving and Passover. Okay. For me, as like sure. just deeply American holidays in many ways. Right. One of the reasons I love the holiday is this kind of very localized variation that you mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. in the way that the stories are told, in the in the traditions around it, in the folklore around it. Because we were talking about this earlier today and over the past couple of days, that in many ways Halloween is the story of immigration. Right. For right. in America, the how Halloween is expressed will vary based on the communities that are in the, the area. It, it's about communities interacting with each other in this really particular way, often in a way that's very uplifting and communal um, and becomes very civic in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I love, one of the things I love is, see, is hearing these different variations. Like, I'm sure, was it South Carolina? Mm -hmm. right. Tells this story very differently than Virginia tells the story, right? right? But it's some the say same that, story. Yeah, Theodosia haunts the beaches of Myrtle Beach. Yeah. Uh, so next time, if anyone's down there for spring break, <laughs> right, right, keep right. your eyes out for Theodosia. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's spooky. And, and yeah, I think you're right. It also, I think it is a, is a good lens into the fear of the unknown that existed um, during these times, right? right? I mean, a ship goes missing. There isn't radio communication. There's not ways of, of really uh, of them radioing for help or, or sending a distress signal in a way if they're far out to sea. And so I think that's a good way of, of showing the context of what life was like and in this fear of the unknown. And I think the traditions of Halloween come from that, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a world that exists when it's dark outside mm -hmm. that we can't penetrate and we're not exactly sure what's going on out there. Right. So storytelling can be a way of, of right. dealing with and storytelling was a way to manage manage death, right? So traditionally, mm -hmm. Halloween happened at the time of, I don't want to mispronounce it, Samhain, which was a holiday, which was a Celtic holiday. Mm -hmm. um, but it also happened at the same time as uh, Central American holidays and Roman holidays right. that all circled around the cycle of life and death at the end of a harvest. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was that at Halloween, because it was this in-between place, between the old season and the new season, between life and the death of winter, right. the, the spirit world was somehow closer and more accessible. Mm -hmm. And so you would dress up, you would honor your dead, you would honor the stories of your society, the stories of your community mm -hmm. on this special night when the when the gateway between worlds was was a little looser. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, exactly the same time right now is Day of the Dead and yeah. the whole concept of 
of that community that's built in yeah. this timing? Because you're right. It could be an opportunity as things are getting colder and you know, you've done your harvest and everything like that, that an individual can feel fear. And yet it becomes this connection to not only the people in your community, but all the people who have come before. Right. Um, and, it, and it is that interesting gateway into what is real and what isn't and what is remembered and what isn't. Right. Yeah. And often Halloween will focus more on children in times of difficulty and turmoil as an outlet for the children to express some some community endeavor that that just in many ways will distract them from things happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So in World War One, Halloween um, became very child focused. Prior to that, it was very focused on families coming together, but also the community having um, having having community events. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the 1920s, we went to um, Halloween having civic parades mm. as a, actually as a way to stop the young people from being like violent and doing the mischievous part. <laughs> right, 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 they right. turned it into this very civic holiday in that period in order to kind of constrain some of the activities of some of the young people during this time of year. Yeah, yeah I think it's interesting, too, because it shows the power that history and storytelling has. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's one of the compelling reasons. We always want to know what's happened before. And when we don't know what happened, it can suddenly develop through this space where things can get spooky, spooky. spooky yes. unknown. Yes. Spooky. And creative, too. You know, like I said, we, we sort of, the way that stories have been told to children, yeah. you know, they, they get passed down. I mean, I think probably the version of, say, the Headless Horseman that I heard yeah. may be different than the versions you all heard. Right. I don't know. I have a state-specific uh, headless horseman story. Okay, because so, so. we grew up in the Northeast, right. and you grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in, in the, the, state, mid, the mid, mid. I grew up in the state of Indiana, the, state which of Indiana. Is the heart of the Midwest. If you ask anyone from Indiana, <laughs> uh, and, and yet I do feel like it's a story from upstate New York, but it was told actually, differently. Well, so here's the story. So, uh, <laughs> Wait a second. Down the road from uh, where I grew up uh, is uh, was one of the early uh, settlements in the central part of Indiana. Uh -huh. Um, and so there's a, a valley there. We're right near the White River. Mm -hmm. And so as you would be coming along, uh, you would hear the echoes of the horse that was bouncing off the wall sort of of this valley. And yeah. So if you were by yourself, and you're riding along and you're hearing the echoes of a horse, it certainly sounds like there's another horse oh, following yeah. you. So the hollow became known as Heady Hollow. Uh -huh. I think in part because of the shared American folklore. Right? Right. So you hear these stories that are coming from the Northeast. Mm -hmm. But the idea that well, maybe there's some real reality to this. Again, right. I'm out here in the unknown, hearing these echoes, right. what's taking place. Right, right, right. And so, it, it was a favorite yeah. pastime in my community. So I grew up in central New Jersey, right. very, not very far from Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow. Exactly. Which, and so as a child, we would um, it, we would be taught this story as part of our New Jersey history in third right. grade and sixth grade and whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And they would go and, and you'd, you'd listen for the hoofs at right. night. Right. To see if, and you'd like, you'd make sure your blinds were drawn so you wouldn't see the glowing eyes. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. And to me, it was very much that was my image of what America was years ago, but it was never exactly what year it was. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was it the 1780s? Right. Was it 1836? Yeah. It, it was just before now, but after the founding. Yeah. That vague American, but that's what it looked like to yeah. all, of us. all of us. Well, I think that's what's really powerful about these narratives too, um, is that it can help students identify that context, right? In a way that's very real for them. They can then yeah. empathize with the characters of the story in a way that just telling you know another story of something may right. not be able to penetrate, right? Right, right. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and so I have another story. If okay. You guys will indulge me. Um, As you're telling the story, people should remember that they can ask that's questions. That's true. So please tell us a story tell us too. A story. We would love to hear your stories um, on Facebook at Bill of Rights Institute or on Twitter at BR Institute or here in the chat box on on YouTube. Yeah. You know, I'm realizing you've got horns and you said from Jersey, and I realized the New Jersey oh, Devil no, story. The New Jersey Devil. The New Jersey Devil story might come up, but. Kirk story. I didn't even realize. Oh, well, so this one's rather well known. Um, uh -huh. I think there's been several uh, television documentaries about it. Uh, but the, the story, the Mary Celeste. Oh, okay. so yeah. I love this story again, thinking about context for a few different reasons. Uh -huh. um, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of debrief on that when I'm done. But so the Mary Celeste <laughs> is a ship that had sailed um, out of New York. Uh -huh. um, and it was perfectly fine when it took off um, with a cargo full of industrial alcohol. Uh, and suddenly, uh, another ship, um, I believe it was called the, uh, the Digretta, comes upon it. It's a British ship. Comes upon the Mary Celeste off the coast of the Azores, which are an island chain off the coast of Portugal, mm -hmm. adrift. Um, so they go up to the ship and they say, well, what's going on? 
when they board the ship, uh, they find that everything is perfectly fine with the ship. Uh, all of the crew's compartments and clothing and everything is all set. Um, all of the charts are sort of tossed about, but they're all there. There's six months worth of food and water all on the ship. So the ship is perfectly sailing, sailable. Um, one of the pumps had been dis disassembled, but the other ship's pump was, was perfectly fine. Um, there was only about three foot of water in the hold, which isn't a much for a ship. And so here's a perfectly good merchant ship that is sailing along on a company. Uh, the only thing that was missing was the navigation equipment and the lifeboat from the ship. What about the industrial alcohol? The industrial alcohol was all there and intact. Interesting. So right. it wasn't pirates, right? It was no, just no, ghost it wasn't ship. pirates. You know, so, so then what's the answer? Okay. So throughout time, Wait, but, and even Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a short story about this in the 1880s, which is one of the reasons it, it kind of stays it's around. You can show and everything else. Um, and we could talk about Arthur Conan Doyle, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, but uh, the, so the, one of the stories goes that uh, the, the crew of the British ship mm -hmm. that took the Mary Celeste in for salvage had actually gotten rid of the crew, right? So, uh, um, so and they just said, said they weren't there anyway. Right, so British Admiralty Courts, if you took a ship in, you would then get a, a payout of whatever that ship yeah, was yeah. insured for, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the crew only ended up after going through trial getting one sixteenth of the total value oh, of the cargo. So some people think, well, Maybe they didn't discover anything, but there was enough questions that you know maybe something else is going on. Um, another posits that uh, the the captain, uh, his chronographer, his uh, chronograph, which is the, the clock by uh -huh. which you measure uh, latitude, yeah. I believe, um, no longitude going across. Yes, right. Um, uh, if you're uh, someone who navigates the seas, please send <laughs> right, right, right. A correction. Thank you. Our giant nautical sand <laughs> uh, So the chronograph could have been broken. Maybe he right. thought he was somewhere else. Maybe he thought that the tides were dragging him towards shore because he was much closer to land than he thought he was. Right. Um, and because one of the pumps may have been broken because they had previously um, had a, a cargo full of coal, which uh -huh. could clog up uh, the pumps they used to use. Right. Maybe the pump wasn't working. Couldn't tell how much water was in. There were some rough seas happening at that time. Mm. Um, and so he thinks, wow, we're about to run ashore. We need to get off this ship as quickly as possible. Um, so maybe that's another reason it happened. But the reality is none of us really know what happened. Ooh. And so it's been this story that uh, I think the ship was discovered in 1872. So uh -huh. since the 1870s, um, this mystery has abounded. Mm -hmm. um, but I like it for a couple of reasons. One, because it gives you an opportunity to talk about the Azores, what they were. They were a major <laughs> uh, place that a lot of ships would stop off on their way to and from. Um, Europe uh, later became a coaling station too, mm -hmm. so good way to tie that hook in. Um, also, again, just talking about the the helplessness of sailors at sea during the age of sail, um, not knowing what you know when your if your navigation is out, you don't know where you're going, no right? GPS. So no GPS, no <laughs> phone calls, no internet. Um, you can't tweet that you're going down <laughs> or having problems. Right. Um, so that all fascinates me too, and I think adds to the allure. And I think again, it's a fun way to bring in some of these. Some of these other stories, um, even talking about salvage, how it is that uh, British crews, because this happened um, during privateering days too, yeah. right? That they would be able to capture a ship and then sell it for profit. Mm -hmm. um, that becomes interesting. And maybe talking about Francis Drake or others. Um, but yeah, so I love that story for that reason because mm -hmm. there's all these fun historical things you can tie in right. mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that that in a, in a story that, that fits the spooky season. <laughs> it does, it does. Yeah, yeah. No, you're exactly right. I like the idea, and, and maybe that's part of it, right? Having a hook, the hook of reality helps a lot, mm -hmm. right? I think the hook of having either a place to turn to, I mean, in this right. case, you've got the ship, like you could do some kind of investigation, right. but it's gonna be inconclusive. Yep. You know, all you know is that there had to be a crew because they were sailing, but then there isn't a crew and what happened to them. I think right. that's a big part of, I'm looking at, I was looking at lists of stories and things around this time of year. And then, and I think having that either object or location, right? right. So many of these stories are, based in a spooky place that you right. can go, right? Right, right? And so it, I think that goes back to what you were saying yeah. before about, um, you know, you're tied to community, that you could go to a place mm -hmm. and everybody there knows the story and you kind of tell it, but it's but it's real because you can go, mm -hmm. right. right? So when I was looking through it, the, uh, the I had to look it up again. Was it the... Uh, the Trans-Allegheny Asylum? Yeah, the Trans-Allegheny oh, yeah. Asylum. Asylum in Western yeah. West Virginia. That yeah. one comes up a lot because there's something about a lot of things happen there, but but you remember the people that were there. You remember the situations. Uh, and that one, over time, because you've got stories from before the Civil War, you've got stories because of the Civil War, you've got stories from the 20s. Um, growing up on Long Island, not, not New Jersey, but Long Island, we had Amityville. Oh, yeah. That was a bad house, place. The house, which... 
It's a bad place, but people, hello to the people who live there now. Who it's just, a lovely place Who just now. bought it recently. Yeah. Um, they did change the address though because of it. But oh, that really? Was, they, like, they, they changed, changed the street. The actual name. address, so That's it's no longer amazing. a favorite. But for those who don't know the Amity, they did make a, a movie about it. TV series too? Was it a TV series? Yeah, the, movie yeah TV it, it, it happened in Little Horror, but it was, uh, you know, that same kind of story where even though if you didn't believe in it, it still was spooky, right? Yeah. So the, as you know, it was a story where uh, someone murdered his old family <clears throat> and then people who bought the house after that were hearing things. There was, you know, this is like a basis for a lot of the spooky things of, you know, things coming out, like ooze from the walls and yeah. stories of, of voices saying, get out and things like this. And every time you would go by, you you got chills, you know, right. but it was a real place and you want them to learn about it. And I think kids are definitely into that. Right. Yeah. And so much of history teaching is pedagogy of place, right? right. So much yeah. of what we do as educators is try and make the place where the where the young people are robust and meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. And stories, spooky stories especially. Right. Again, growing up in New Jersey is a particularly spooky place. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a there's a series called Weird History right. that many of you I'm sure are familiar with. It started as a as a catalog that I used to get yeah, back yeah. in the 80s and 90s, um, where it was just like a newsprint catalog that would come, and it was all these stories. New Jersey has the New Jersey Devil. We have all these different 13 Bumps Road. Right. Um, there are just all these stories of weird, spooky places. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them tied into real historical events in those places, sure. right? Yeah. 13 Bumps Road, I don't remember the story, but let's just say 13 Bumps Road was a Revolutionary War graveyard, right? Because it's New Jersey, right. you have this kind of context right. of space. And often, especially around this season, um, the, traditionally Halloween has very has been very place-based, right? So mm -hmm. um, you'll see this in Central America and, and Mexico, especially with using the, the cemetery as the, the space mm -hmm. in which you have the Dia de los Muertos um, festivals. You go, there, that fantastic movie Coco really showcased this right. really well. Right. Um, a it's a great kind of cultural touch point for students. Uh, but often it was very place-based. And so as we have more transient communities and more transient students, I think making sure that these, uh, these are being discussed <laughs> um, is really important and, and, and binding them to the place they are and honoring the place they are with mm -hmm. these kinds of stories uh, can be really powerful. Yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. I was handed like something gotta... from a ghost hand has <laughs> brought us a question statement. Uh, Nicholas from YouTube. Right? Hi, Nicholas. And I'm going to toss this out as our, our resident knowledge of stories. says, the strange death of Silas Dean, regular businessman or colonial American spy? I don't know. Do I you know, know the story? The story of Silas Dean. Dean. I, 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 it sounds familiar enough for yeah. me to make a bunch of misstatements. Okay. <laughs> um, we can make up a story. But I do think that espionage is, is an interesting one, too, because there's yeah. so many stories around espionage. Right. right. You know, particularly... Yeah. On the olden days, right? the olden right. days, right? That we weren't, that aren't quite clear, right? So now right. stories about Washington spies and things have been right. published recently that that have been really interesting. But um, I was actually the other day I was in Chinatown here, being close to uh, history here in Washington D.C. like we are, and uh, I walked past the boarding house of Mary Surratt, which is ah. where John Wilkes yeah. Booth, um, right. his co-conspirators met. Um, you can still see it now. In, there's a plaque on the uh, building in in Chinatown. I think it's near Seventh and H. If you ever find yourself. In Washington D.C., um, but uh, but there's rumors that Mary Surratt herself was also a spy, and so I think there's something interesting about that too. That yeah. that that can be kind of spooky and, and unknown um, in this world of of unknown things. Right. Um, the Cold War is very good for that too. Mm. I found Lincoln terrifying as a child. <laughs> I did. I and this is a true story for, uh, for all the people on YouTube. Let <laughs> forever me and ever now. Forever and ever. Let me tell America. <laughs> I, uh, you know how many children, and, and I guess this ties in, many right. children have trouble sleeping, right? Yeah. right? There is a monster under the bed, there's something in the corner. A president in the closet. <laughs> Quite literally, that was my problem. I believed Abraham Lincoln was in my room and was going to exact revenge for his assassination. Oh, wow. Until I was convinced by my parents that of all the, and they would say, there are 200,000, 200 million Americans I don't think you're at the top of the list so for revenge. For revenge, right? And Lincoln having nothing to have done with it. And I realized, you know so what? They logic you out of it. They logic me out of it. I realized, you know what? I'd probably see on the news that Abraham Lincoln was killing people before he got to me. 
I'm glad to be safe and ready what for it. What was so, it's so this is, I'm gonna prod this a little bit okay. in front of all our friends I, I want, internet. yeah, let's, let's, <laughs> the psychology of, let's turn this webinar into the psychology of, of fear. Go ahead. Uh, but, but what, what was it about that story that was so compelling? Do you remember, because, because the, the story of Abraham Lincoln is a, is an incredibly complex topic for students to, to work through um, with this horrifically tragic kind of end, <laughs> yes. right? Like right. Yeah. horrifically tragic. I can absolutely answer that. And this, this goes to a lot of what we're talking about. There's that magical time in America where there was some photography in the stories, mm, but yeah. not enough. Right. right. So it's hard to get scared now because I think we're used to, you know, Hollywood imagery and things like this. Yeah. Things are very clear and things that are too far are a little too intellectual. Mm -hmm. But what was terrifying about this, and, and you mentioned before the 1920s, right. mm -hmm. what's terrifying is if you, you have these photographs that are fuzzy and dark and, and you know as a child that many of those early photographs are of dead people, yeah. right? Because yeah. the early tin, tin types, yep. yeah. the uh -huh. garrow type, yep. 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 Um, are you know, people that they had to stand still for a long time. So that you know that they're all dead. They're not smiling. They're not smiling. It is so, so Lincoln and all this happening uh, was very much, ooh, spooky card. Um, and all this happening, I think, is part of that, right? Like you said before, there's this unknown element to the Lincoln story. Uh -huh. Who is in on it? What was his feeling on it? And then, of course, visiting DC, if you go, um, and you can see the bedroom that has the pillow oh, that still has his blood on it. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. When you are five. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of that, <laughs> no, absolutely. It's sort of that reality. I mean, it makes it real, almost. right? This, this actually right? happens, and it's, and it's again dealing with an unknown that's right. yeah a very tragic end, mm -hmm. right? right. Um, you know, we're also in this area surrounded by a lot of Civil War battlefields, um, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of ghost stories that come out of that too. Because again, right. it, it becomes very real. It's a very tragic thing that happens. It's someone's family. It's someone's family, and when you start making those connections. It's jump out to you yeah absolutely yeah okay so jennifer from youtube mm -hmm. says that she recently learned about the ghost of john andre ha a haunting tap in new york and the 76th house do we know about this so one? so tap in new york i know i've yeah. been to and there are definitely a lot of spooky things up and so it's uh it's slight i mean i call it upstate I'm from Long Island. It's not. It's probably. <laughs> it's not actual. Sorry, people. Yeah, sorry, sorry, actual New Yorkers. Case. Yeah, we're, <laughs> uh, we're, I was about to say upstairs, um, but um, I know what was the name again? Tap, uh, John Andre. John Andre from Tap in New York. Yeah, Tap, Tap is a spooky area. It's very. Um, uh, now again, not in a bad way to all of our Tap and the followers out there, but it's uh, you know it's a lot of those those creaky woodlands yeah. and a lot of those tales of right. you know it's it's just the right amount of cold out uh, and you don't know who's watching you as you travel around there. So yeah. even though I don't know that particular Lots of curves one, in the road. like curves in the road, and yeah, you break down and there's the howling winds and things like that. And so I can uh, no, I guess it. <laughs> Um, that's a little thing, right? So, right. so the history of of campfire tales, yes. right? I imagine you're talking about community. You're talking yeah. about sort yeah. of bonding and separation of what. Are, what are your thoughts on campfire tales and the value of them in our culture? Well, I think I mean it is intimately tied with that kind of community building that was happening. It was they were they were tales of your own history, but in many ways it was there to desensitize you in some ways to. The kind of difficulties of adult life right right so they're they're supposed to be there's often a moral aspect right like the child this happened to the child because they didn't behave or right. this happened to the person because they did something right. that wasn't appropriate and this was their punishment right yeah. so there's a kind of moralism that often happens mm -hmm. in spooky story campfire tales but it also again does this binding you to a place right, right. You feel the wind you like hear the rustling yeah, right, right? Right. right and so traditionally these were done uh, originally around campfires with the elders telling the stories of mm -hmm. the ancient peoples of the, of, the, of the ancestors but then they would move into homes and so you had these these uh, you would invite neighbors into your home and there would be very much in the home right um, and then and in the in the 40s uh, when again we went to really making it about children, but also wanting to bind communities together, we started sending the children out into the community right. um, to do the trick or treating, mm -hmm. as opposed to having the having the, the storytelling being internal. Right. The storytelling would happen like out in the world. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. It's also interesting, you know, sort of this tension between sort of the the 
civilized world in which you lived and then something else that exists right. outside it's very of Shakespearean. the community. Yeah, it's yeah. very, you know, we're here, we have all these, you know, the delights of modernity, <laughs> but if you go out and sit by that campfire, right, right, and right. there's these unknown rustlings in the wind, mm -hmm. and if it's dark and scary and there's shapes yeah. that come out of you, you know, sort of, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, right. you know, people are gathering around sort of building these myths to say what is on the other side of that river, lake, forest. Right. Or whatever. And it's not just a simple retelling. I think about the connection to classrooms now and how, you know, many young students now are so used to the meme culture right. Right. and the idea of of one upping each other with a story. And I think yeah. campfire stories are like that. Because when you I mean you mentioned the hook thing and I was brought back <laughs> yeah. to the first time I heard that, and it was at a summer camp, you know, and it was and I remember like one person and they would be telling one story and then oh I have one that's even scarier <laughs> yeah. than that one. And it would and it has to be just the right amount of almost supernatural, but maybe doesn't have to. Right. And most of the stories we're telling aren't, mm -hmm. right? These are things that actually happened and are just spooky mm -hmm. things that happen yeah. to actual people. Right. Unexplained. Unexplained things. But it's always, do I have one more? And that art of, of conversation is interesting one because I, we've learned a lot about that, how you know, decades and even centuries ago, that was your art form, mm -hmm. was conversation with people. Um, and sometimes it was family, but sometimes it was a way to do it with strangers. I mean, Halloween's one, but you know, the idea of, of Christmas being a big time mm -hmm. for spooky stories is yeah. a really interesting tradition that I feel like has changed a little bit. Yeah. But there was definitely a time where that was what you did. Yeah. Yeah. And culturally too. I mean, it com coming from different places, different, different people bringing their own traditions to um, different, uh, different holidays, everything else. I mean, spooky stories don't just stop at Halloween. They, they're, right. they're told all year long. Right. Um, and they, they keep us on our toes. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. And bind the community together, right? Common tales. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, our uh, the stories we tell are now very different. We pass them by resharing them on Facebook as opposed to sitting around a campfire. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, but there's still that kind of that diffusion of folklore mm -hmm. that happens consistently Absolutely. in our lives. Um, but because it's in this different, in this mediated way, I wonder, I wonder about the importance of like sitting down and telling stories versus giving your kids something to read or, right, or right, watching right. a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There... Yeah. I mean, one of the stories I think about is, um, is the Warrens in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So the, yes, the Warrens in Connecticut is, again, one of those ones that I, being near Connecticut, we had heard this. I don't know if you've heard this one. It was no. early 70s through 1970 or so, and they were paranormal specialists. The Warrens, I do know. The Warrens. Them, yeah. um, is it Ed and I want to say Lorraine Warren. Um, and this is a tale that had just been told around, and the idea was that there was a spirit in the house, and then it had attached itself to a Raggedy Ann doll. Mm -hmm. And the Raggedy Ann doll, you know, it seems innocuous, and although they can be creepy at night, um, and the Warrens are called in, and the stories from this uh, were really getting out of hand. There were handwritten notes that were mysteriously written by no one in the house in a different hand. The Raggedy Ann doll, of course, would move around. It was a very eerie uh, elf on the pre-elf on the shelf, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is spooky if you think about it. Um, but. Uh, it eventually got to the point where they were going to lock it up and then there was some they had a museum mm -hmm. where they put it in there and there was a, a a guy who was taunting the doll and immediately was in this horrible motorcycle accident and all these curse kind of thing and yeah. the spirit attached to it was annabelle and that became the story of that whole series yeah. of movies that are very popular now the wow. You can tell me on YouTube. <laughs> the big, really popular series with Annabelle and, oh, goodness, it, I'm losing it. I the know the horror film. Right? No, not The Exorcist. No, no, it's like it's like eight or nine. American Josh American. knows. No. No. <laughs> YouTube is going to blow YouTube's up. YouTube's going to tell us. I set this whole thing up and now it. Yeah. The Conjuring. The Conjuring. Oh, Thank you, no. Josh, our producer, The Conjuring. Yes. That well, did YouTube do that for yeah. us? Did they tell us? Yeah, that? Josh, okay, no, Josh told us. And so Josh. the story is still being told, but in a different form, right? Yeah. So kids will know this story in a classroom yeah. from the movies, and it doesn't take away, I don't know, because yeah. it's still being told, because then you retail, oh, so, this actually happened. You know, yeah, but the curse is fascinating. I hadn't been thinking about curses, but curses are really interesting, Spooky. too. Because again, it's that connection. Mm -hmm. So I'm reminded of uh, the discovery of Tutankhamun. Ah, yes. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and uh, this has a modern connection, by the way. If we have any Downton Abbey fans, oh, uh, Downton Abbey Castle, time. Let's uh, get comfortable. The, uh, yeah, High <laughs> Castle is the home of the Lord Carnarvon, who's the financial backer behind the um, discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, the gentleman who discovered it, uh, Carter. Carter, um, uh, obviously was funded by him to go explore right. Tutankhamun's tomb, but. 
that story of that mystery, right? And that became real for me when I was a kid because they brought Tutankhamun's like sarcophagus yeah. to on a tour, yeah, to yeah. Indianapolis. It was in the children's museum. You can go see this thing. It's really impressive. They, they, put, it, they put it in the museum of history. They put it in the children's museum. Just, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think if I remember, Rome, I remember. I spent a lot of time in the museums when I was a kid, so really? it could have gone. I know. Uh, like it was a natural history. But, no, but, 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 but yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing because it's like it's this idea that you know he goes down and we, uh, probably uh, we all know the tale. I think, but we uh-huh. go down and discover this un- previously unknown, undiscovered tomb of this child king no. who had been maybe murdered, maybe maybe not. Who no one knows. Another mystery. Um, and, and to discover this tomb, and then everybody who's associated with it suddenly <laughs> getting strange illnesses and dying yeah. recently after that, right? And, right? and it's this idea of both of, again, the, the known and the unknown colliding with one another, mm-hmm. uh, because it's this mysterious sort of uh, uh, remnant of the past that we know about, but we don't really know about right. it, um, and then you discover it, and it's like, well, what? taking place and all of a sudden people are getting ill right you know maybe it's very you know known and explainable probably is but there's this mysterious element to it that i think is, is just fascinating yeah um and who knows i mean maybe high clear's finally gotten over it because of the success of downton abbey i don't know but uh, uh but yeah it's fascinating but the legend continues, though. Yeah, right? You say to incumbent, and I still think, yeah. you know, it, it'd be one thing if there were a bunch of mysterious deaths, and the one thing they had in common is that they all had something to do with right. to incumbent. But yeah. then, if the warning was there, yeah. well, you know, yeah, yeah, then, yeah. then it's it's a no brainer. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. they were cursed. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, clearly. <laughs> it's the only. I think you could be as logical as you want, but there's all things. I, I I confessed my Lincoln thing. There's all things that yeah. still still spook yeah. you out. And right. that's what I think the power of it is, right? right. I mean, even even mysteries of things that we know a lot about, but right. yet we don't know about it. So things like Atlantis, right? right. Did it exist? Did it not? What's going on with the Minoans, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. Even the pyramids themselves, like the, the ages. Well, that was aliens. That was very clear. Well, aliens. well obviously. You but, watch uh, the history channel. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Clear. <laughs> um, but even things like you know uh, the 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 Olmec civilization in Central America, sure, right? Yeah. Like, there, there's these questions that we have, and I think that's. The amazing thing about wonder and using these stories to sort of inspire that sense of wonder uh, right. is that it's, a, it, it's one opportunity of many. There's lots of, of ways to do it, but it's one opportunity to really bring that into the classroom and, and, and get people focused on something that's mysterious. Yeah, you know? I love I love these kinds of stories for doing what Montessori and Montessori pedagogy. There's this idea of the firing the imagination mm-hmm. that you start every lesson with a story that's so interesting. That they can't help but want to know more, right? And so, starting with a with a mystery or a really, you know, like the overcoming right. the heroic act humanizes the experience for the for the for the, the students, but it also gives them a model to work off of. So uh-huh. often in in kind of the history of Halloween and the history of kind of this 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 time of year, um, we're we're practicing different cultural norms right Mm -hmm. like what does it mean to go up and introduce yourself to an adult you don't know right right what does it mean to interact with your friend group in public right right what does it mean to you're practicing all of these norms of civil institutions if you're letting the kids do it unsupervised there's a bit of a tension sometimes between creating safety, which was always a theme, like right. kids being safe around in this couple of weeks right. has been a concern for parents for yeah. thousands of years. Right, right, right. It didn't start in the 70s and 80s. Right, right. It has like, parents have always been concerned, which is why for a long time, Halloween activities took place in the home. Right. Um, mm. But as part of a kind of uh, impetus around the uh, around World War II to bind communities together to, to like love your fellow man and get to know your neighbor mm-hmm. they would send them out into the community on yeah. these trick-or-treat hunts uh-huh. right um, erring on the treating yeah. and so there's this like what does it mean to be a part of a community where you're interacting in this meaningful way with strangers yeah um, helps model good behaviors in a variety of different ways. Right. Mm-hmm. Another thing I think that's interesting to model, and also part of the origins that I, I learned, you probably you know much better, but the idea that it is a day of charity in a way that isn't condescending. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? It is a day that originates in, here's a time with soul cakes, right? right. Here's uh-huh. a time to give to those in need. Right. 
in a way that wasn't, you know, that, in a way that kind of brought everybody together because right. then it was everybody doing this. Right. Uh, and it was um, sort of, yeah, sort of couched in this really interesting, I don't know, generosity of community. Right. Yeah. I think even costumes are interesting, right? We're yeah. all dressed up a little bit in costumes. I'm not. Uh, no. But the, uh, well, here it is. <laughs> Wear this usually. It's my sailor. Uh, but, uh, um, first of all, go Nets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, we just, no, we're going to blow up on YouTube now, yeah. all of our Houston. Houston, yeah. Yeah, all of our Houston fans. Uh, but, uh, but I think, but I think something about that escapism is interesting, right? Or, right. or, or pretending to be something else or someone else, whether that's aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that, me dressing up as maybe an astronaut when I was a kid, right. can't do math, so that was never going to happen. Uh, right. Um, but but something about sort of that wanting to be something, wanting right. to be someone else, um, and, and showing that part of the human character, right. I think is really interesting. Right. As well, well and that, I mean, I think Halloween has become such an amazing way to explore the potential mm -hmm. um, when it's done well, right? right. That like right. you see so many amazing costumes yeah. of people you admire, or characters from history, or mm -hmm. characters from literature yeah. that are really powerful yeah. for these young people to make costumes around mm -hmm. right it 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 has become this moment where you can honor these figures in history it wasn't always that way it right. started to trick the demons from not knowing who you were right, right right on the day that the barrier between death and life was fragile right after this webinar google 1920s children <laughs> halloween costumes <laughs> Terrifying. It's really scary okay. <laughs> because they were supposed to be as as grotesque as possible, right. in order to mimic the demons and ghouls who would be around, so that you would trick them right. into not knowing it was you. Um, in the twenties, right. prior to that, it was actually to honor certain ancestors. Right. Exactly. Um, right. So, like there, and again, one of the things that's fascinating is you see Halloween costumes interpreted a lot of different ways mm -hmm. uh, because this is a uniquely American way of celebrating this holiday. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it reflects all of the different, you know, ethnic, regional, racial groups that contribute to our great society. Mm -hmm. And so you see lots of different ways that people interpret how, like, maybe it is Batman, maybe it's your grandmother, maybe it's Sally Ride, right? right like right. it could be or any a of clever those. concept. Or just a clever yeah. concept. Or maybe all you did was put on makeup and a pair right. of horns. Right. Yeah. And that's okay too, yeah. right? No, I, I almost love that as a, as a sort of a research project, right? Because right? everything in Halloween that we do has a story behind it, right? Yeah. I mean, even Jack o' lanterns have a story behind it, right? <gasps> Fun fact, and, do you yes. know? Oh, please. So, okay, I actually so know, I know. Jack o' cover. Um, so much of our Halloween costumes come from the Irish influx of immigrants in the 18th, at, at the, uh, because they had a tradition around Samhain of family storytelling and family gathering. And there was this kind of notion that the Irish community around family was like, uh, a more gentle age and so people wanted to mimic that mm -hmm. in the period so they adopted this kind of um almost like a, a, a the, the, the kind of noble agrarian idea around mm -hmm. irish immigrants at any rate um in ireland they would carve turnips okay but turnips are really hard to carve and so when they got to the u.s uh -huh. they're like Pumpkin squash is so much easier. Much better than turnips. <laughs> so now we carve pumpkins um, instead of turnips, which I think is hilarious. I kind of yeah. want to carve a turnip this there year. You, you always try. Throwback. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me, uh, sort of a, a silly uh, thing for investigating these things is the excellent movie from the uh, mid '90s, Hocus Pocus. Oh. Uh, which is, a, good which is a classic. It's a classic. Um, I think I, maybe it's But it classic. explores all these themes, I think, right? Because yeah. it, it looks at the city, I think, of Salem, Salem. Massachusetts, and right. the right. Sanderson sisters, right? Right. Uh, don't light the candle at midnight. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know what made me think of that, but just <laughs> sort of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun way to kind of look at some of these traditions and see how they're evolving and what part of the community they take place in, right? right. Because it was a big thing in the movie that they were celebrating Halloween. And, right. Um, Anyway, yeah. Well, you were just talking about the impression of people around Sam because we did programs in Connecticut last week. Yes. And so, what were you? What were you? Uh, Boston. I was oh, in Boston. Oh, you were in Boston. No, yes. that's right. You were in Boston yesterday. Hi, <laughs> everybody. I just saw yesterday. Um, yeah, they were talking about you know again many of these teachers who grew up there have been there a, a, a while and they're saying that it's an interesting balance from from how we started this conversation right. of of local history and and being able to go down the street and see these things and sort of the increasing national notoriety of it right. and and sort of tension is a strong word but they were sort of saying that the you know the kinds of statues that are put up or the kind of events that are happen take their the local story and push it into a direction that 
may or may not be the direction that they no longer feels authentic to yeah, their yeah to, to their, their town to their history to their, to their knowledge of the area kind of thing and so on the one side you want people to tell your stories on the other side right. you know the flexibility in the direction those stories go in yeah right maybe not for everybody Right. Like yeah. Hocus Pocus. Like I, guess, I mean, it's worth mentioning. We <laughs> sorry, know, we sorry, we interrupted. One of, of the most, well, <laughs> we ignored one of the most famous stories, Halloween stories in America, yeah. which is the Salem, Salem Witch Trials. Right. right. And then famously portrayed in the play The Crucible, right? right. And then the movie The Crucible. Right. Um, and the Hocus Pocus. Is the Crucible. Right, right. right. But yeah, but I think it's interesting, right? It's, it's how these things get taken and changed um, is a reflection and, of sort of the diversity that happens across the country, state to state, and right. locality to locality. And the assumptions people make then about the people who live there, right. you know, things like that. It's, Halloween is now the second most commercial holiday in the United States after after Christmas. Mm -hmm. So in terms of national national identity as indicated by the funding we spend on it, the money we spend on it, right, right. in the national consciousness, Halloween is number two only after Christmas. Right. Um, so it is a huge, and it's, and again, Part of that comes from wealth and, you know, our idea that we want to kind of showcase what we're able to do with the holiday, but also part of, part of it is this, this community endeavor that it becomes, right? right, right. I mean, similar to Christmas lights, yeah. there's this, I mean, there are sure, streets yeah. here in our area where they are famous for their decorations yeah. right, right, um, right. and yeah. for, for, for the community that they provide around those decorations. Yeah. Well, speaking of decorations, yeah. I'm sure we all have to go home and get ready for tomorrow's yes. decorations. Yes, gotta get my turnips. So, <laughs> so unfortunately, I think we're about at time. Um, uh, but, uh, but if anyone has any final ghost stories, no. spooky things to this share, this was super fun. Please share with us your favorite spooky stories from your region. Yeah, we would love to hear what you do with students around this time of year. How you create community in your class classroom across different cultures. Um, and how you use narrative, if, uh, yeah. if you know how it is that you tie narrative into your classroom, uh, whatever the subject may be. Yeah, we never tire of stories here at BRI. So the few that uh, of you that wrote in already, uh, you know, follow up with us if you haven't already, uh, because we never tire of the hooks that stories are. Yes. Absolutely, and as always, if there's other topics that you'd like to see us cover on these webinars, please feel free to send those suggestions in. Um, as well, we're here to serve you. Um, and so, any ideas you have or topics you'd like us to cover, um, we, we love hearing feedback. So. Uh, but I think for now, we'll all retreat all right. to our own spooky modes. <laughs> uh, and thank you all for joining us. Be and safe we'll out there. Um, in a couple weeks. Yay. Yeah, see you. Thank you so much. Be Take care. careful. Take care. Ooh.